Good afternoon, uh, Małgorzata Bonikowska, the Center for International Relations. Welcome to our Tuesday talk, Zoom the World, the series we are doing with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Uh, we are normally discussing generally the situation in the world, uh, the Euro European Union. Today, we want to focus on a country we haven't discussed yet, Italy. Italy uh, in Poland, my country, uh, of course, uh, Italy is a very well known country as far as culture, history, but not maybe we follow very much the current political changes in Italy. And that's what we want to discuss today and also how Italians see themselves and how Italians see the European Union and the world. Let me welcome our guests today. Professor Luisa Białasiewicz. Hello, Luisa. Hello, very nice to be here. Very, very, very happy to have you. Luisa, actually, um, uh, she's a Polish uh, scholar, but it has many years, has been many years she works abroad. She uh, is actually a professor at, uh, uh, of European governance at University of Amsterdam. But currently she is in Italy, as you can see from the map, maybe behind you, right? Where are you now? I am in Rome, so I actually have a, Ro a map of the Rome metropolitan area behind me. And since I'm a geographer, I'm a political geographer by training, I have to have a map. Right, great. So Luisa is also um, teaching at uh, College of Europe. So uh, she comes uh, regularly to Poland, to Natolin as well, to teach European governance. And um, her background being very normally being based in Netherlands, so you can also tell us how um, uh, the Western Europeans, the Northern Europeans maybe see Italy. Uh, and Emidio Diodado, uh, buongiorno, buonasera. Hi. Buongiorno. Hi. Uh, Emidio, Emidio is speaking to us from Perugia, right? Yeah. Uh, Emidio is professor uh, at University for uh, Foreigners in Perugia. And she, uh, he teaches international politics. And of course, I don't need to tell you that he is Italian in the heart of Italian politics. So hope it will help us to, uh, to understand what's going on in Italy. The, the reason why we want to talk about Italy is of course the recent shift in power because Italy had a change of the government. And this was quite a complicated political maneuver which happened, the prime minister uh, changed and the whole government changed. So first question will go to Emilio. Uh, how can you comment on this change? How, how how deep is the change? What really has changed except for just the names and the prime minister who is now Mario Draghi, very prestigious, very well known Italian, not only in Italy, but also in the European Union, a former um, president of European Central Bank. Yeah, in order to understand the Draghi government, we have to come back to the last um, uh, national elections in Italy. Uh, since during the last parliamentary term, after the 2018 elections, uh, there have been uh, three different coalition governments in Italy. Uh, the first Conte government, the second uh, Conte government, and now the Draghi government. Um, I think it's important to underline this point that mm, due to the electoral system, in uh, 2018, uh, there were two winners in the general elections. I, I know that it sounds strange, but there were two winners, two different winners. Uh, the Five Star Movement, a post-ideological populist party, as they say, beyond left and right, and it was the, the winner as the most voted party inside Italy and a center-right coalition led by Matteo Salvini's league and as the strongest coalition. So the Italian political system, as you know, is a parliamentary system. That means that the government must have the trust of the parliament. However, when there is a political chaos for example, with two winners in the elections, the president of the Republic has the power to play the game according to the Italian constitution. And so in 2018, after the so-called consultation with the political parties, President Mattarella, his name is Sergio Mattarella, uh, formed a coalition government by, led by Giuseppe Conte, uh, 
and he was an outsider in the Italian uh, political scene. And but by the way, we are commenting, we are commenting on this coalition. How could it happen that such an original coalition was made of two parties who were completely different as far as ideology? Because it was the only possible, possible solution. Uh, there were two winners and the, the president Mattarella decided to constrain the two winners to work together. So the Five Star Movement on one side and the Liga on the other part. So they were able to form this new government. Um, but what is important to understand is that Mattarella refused at the time to appoint an Eurosceptic minister to the economy. And in my opinion, this choice is very relevant today in order to understand the current political situation in Italy. So in the case of the League, uh, we uh, empirical study shows that uh, that cultural backlash played a fundamental role in boosting the party's success, um, as its appeal proved uh, especially strong in the, the northern regions of Italy, characterized by a manifest presence of foreign residents of Islamic religion. And this point confirms the importance of the cultural factors in the current Italian context. Namely, so you, 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 you want to tell us that still Italy is divided, that the, the, the division between North and South matters, that's what you want to say? Absolutely, yes. In the case of the Five Star Movement, empirical research shows uh, that um, it was strong uh, in the southern regions characterized by poor institutional performance and high concentration of the so-called economic losers of the, of the globalization process. In these regions of the South, the Five Star Movement, um, the, the Five Star Movement's promise to introduce the so-called universal basic income or to abolish poverty proved particularly appealing for the electorate. So these two populist parties has very different political background, different um, economic um, political performance, but they were able uh, um, to form uh, uh, a coalition government. And it was um, a kind of right wing oriented government with, as I said before, an outsider such as Conte leading a very strange coalition but a coalition that was generally considered as Eurosceptic. Hmm? Okay, but let me let me stop here because uh, just to clarify to the viewers, uh, we had this coalition since the elections in 2018, when actually we had these two winners uh, completely on the opposite political sides because we can say that Movimento Cinque Stelle, Five Star Movement, it's more like a little bit leftist party with a lot of uh, accent to the ecology, etc. It's very it's not even a party, they, they promote themselves as a movement. And um, Lega, which is a quite conservative uh, right party. It would Conte as a, as a neutral, as academician who was a prime minister because none of two leaders were able to agree. So they were both, um, they decided to be pri uh, deputy prime ministers. And then we had another guy as number one in the office. But now what happened because, um, we had recently the change because the government of Conte uh, failed and we have a completely new political situation. Maybe we can shift to Luisa. Luisa, can you comment on this change? Because in the recent years, Italians seem to change her mind. Uh, Lega seems to be still very popular, but Movimento Cinque Stelle is, is not that popular as it was, definitely is losing. We have opinion polls from March now, just now. Uh, let me just quote that uh, Lega means conservative 24%. That's opinion polls. That's not elections, that's opinion polls. Um, um, five star movement, it's around 16%, much less than they got because they in the elections they got 33%. So it's half of what they got. Then we have PD, which is uh, left, which is Partito Democratico, 18%, which is a stable, similar support all the time. And we have Fratelli d'Italia, it's uh, uh, 
uh, Italian brothers with, uh, who got now get much more than than they got in 2018, which is also right, radical right, we can say. And finally, Forza Italia, uh, which is now less popular than it was in 2018. Now it has only 7%. So, Luisa, how can you comment on this change? Why is it so different? Well, it's, you know, it's different, but it's also not that different. And I guess I would, you know, build on what Emilio said in terms of, you know, kind of drawing both the genealogy of the Lega and the Cinque Stelle support, but also how that has been transformed. So I think it's important to think of the Lega and Cinque Stelle as two varieties of populism, as two, you know, kind of populist parties that certainly in electoral terms, you know, divided up Italy, because I mean, the Cinque Stelle swept the South, essentially. And you can, you know, give various explanations for it as people have. Um, I mean, what is amazing is that the Lega actually did get votes in the South. I mean, for a party that, you know, some of the viewers will be aware of, made its fortunes on, you know, deprecating the South, saying that, you know, it, you know I mean, this was an originally an autonomous party. In fact, for the last rounds of the several last elections, it's only the Lega. It's no longer called the Northern League. It's just simply the Lega. But I think we need to kind of keep that in mind. And regarding, I think, both the Lega's fortunes or misfortunes now, and especially the decline in support for the Cinque Stelle, I mean, let's take, you know, let's take them separately. I think the Lega was very much penalized by its quite ambiguous positions and actually contradictions during this year of the pandemic. Um, one, because they flirted very much with some of the anti-lockdown movements at the start. And in a moment like this one, and not just in Italy, but pretty much everywhere, um, voters are looking for stability. I mean, people want reassurance. And so, you know, there is a kind of rallying around um, existing governments. I mean, unless they've really messed up the pandemic response, um, you know, that's where the support goes. I mean, we can see this in the Netherlands where, you know, I would certainly say the, Ruta, the previous Ruta government, now there will be a new one, really did not do very well at all. Um, and yet, you know, they got that support. Um, in the case of the Cinque Stelle, apart from internal divisions, substantial ones over the course of this past year, and there too, kind of attitudes to the pandemic response were really important. I mean, this is a party that had outright negationists, people who would show up to the anti-vax protests, you know, in, in some of these moments. Um, but also other political divides. So I think, you know, internal divisions, the fact that there were a number of high profile um, Cinque Stelle figures, such as the mayor of Torino, the mayor of Rome, who really, you know, I won't say disgraced themselves, but certainly did not reveal themselves to be capable administrators, that did not help. And I think, you know, in a moment of crisis, such as this one, um, voters want capable professional politicians that are also coherent in what they're offering. So now why Mario Draghi comes to the scene? Uh, maybe this explains why uh, the president of the Republic called for this very well-known expert, not a full politician, Emilio. Can you explain to us now what is the government? Because you said Conte 1, which was actually Lega plus Movimento Cinque Stelle, then what was Conte 2 government yeah, when I, I, Lega I, was replaced by BD, right? And now what, what do we have? Yeah, I think we, we have to come back to the Conte 2 first. It's important to understand the current situation. And a very important point was the European election in May 2019. And in, in May 19, 2019, the political scenario changed dramatically in Italy. Uh, as, it, as you know, the pro-European parties won the European election at the European level hmm, and later formed the new von der Leyen Commission. Hmm. But in Italy, it was the League that was the most voted party at that time in the same election. So there was a contradiction between the, the League level the league who was anti-europe not anti-european euro skeptic let's put it this way strongly strongly <laughs> euro skeptic so what's happened uh, that this electoral out output in europe opened the a crisis into the coalition government the prime minister conte uh, was able to manage 
the move of the Five Star Movement towards a pro-European stance. The Italian government and the um, Five Star Movement's deputies in the European Parliament supported the new European Commission led by the von, uh, von der Leyen. And um, Salvini, who at that time was supported by the opinion polls that gave him the role of the winner of the, the new electoral race, uh, this re reacted asking for new election. And for the second time, the role of the president of the Republic, Mattarella, was very important. Mattarella decided uh, not to allow new elections and forced the Five Star Movement to form a, no a new coalition government with the left, from the right to the left. And Which was also a very kind of a, uh, uh, not expected uh, coalition, right? Very, very strange. Yeah, yeah, but was a kind of a transition. It was not a, a move from the right to the left, but it was a move from an anti-European stance to a pro-European stance. That was the kind of transformation after the European election. So let so, me let me just let me just uh, understand better. So yeah. Lega was out of the government, and it still keeps this position of being eurosceptical. But it was yeah. Out. Yeah. out. And then the previous government, the Conte two government, was a pro-European government. Yeah. Since the, but, the Democratic Party was, is a very strong pro-European party. Yes, but now I still I keep <laughs> repeating my question. What happened now? that uh, we have now a Mario Draghi government, because Matteo Renzi seems to be an important pr player. Matteo Renzi, who was a young prime minister of Italy, and he decided to quit and found his own political party. So if you can explain to us why did he withdraw the support for Conte II government? Um, Margarita, it's not easy to answer. So the Draghi government was not part of the planes of the Five Star Movement of the Democratic Party. As, as you said, it was the former prime minister, Matteo Renzi, who decided to, um, to quit the experience of the, the, the Conte government. Uh, there are many different interpretations, uh, different opinions about this point. But what is important to understand and that for the first time, it was the president of the Republic to decide the outcome of the crisis. And it's very important to understand the Italian political system. It was the president Mattarella who decided to appoint Draghi as prime minister. There was not a five star movement of the Democratic Party. They wanted to continue with Conte. They said the Conte three, a new, the other, another Conte government, government. And but it was the president of the Republic that said, no, we have to, um, to put Italy in the road to Maastricht, <laughs> the road to European, constraints and so he forced these two party two parties to form a new coalition with Draghi that as you know is a kind of symbol of the euro currency of the uh, um, process of integration of the European Union. Exactly Luisa tell us uh, how the Europeans uh, uh, see Mario Draghi what would be your expectations because it's a very well known figure in Europe Absolutely. And, you know, and I think, um, I mean, you know, the, the, the short answer is very positively, um, maybe also for the wrong reasons. And I have to say that um, I think, you know, and I, I think Emilio described very well the path that brought Mario Draghi to his current role. And it's, it is really important, you know, to stress that in part because there was the impossibility to reform a new government, but this was, you know, and an kind of an active, you know, kind of taking of a stand by the president Mattarella to say that in this moment, it is really important to have a stable and strong government. And his figure was the most logic one because, and this is before I answer your question, how this is seen in Europe, there are a number of challenges. I mean, the first most pressing one is to address, you know, the challenges of the pandemic, whether it is, um, sufficient, you know, vaccine rollout, which is remaining a challenge um, to, you know, kind of ensuring um, that, you know, the country kind of goes along while, you know, also respecting the lockdown measures. But then there is the next generation EU fund, the famous recovery fund. 
And even that became such a, you know, a point of contestation between the various parties, you know, between the Lega, between the Movimento Cinque Stelle, the PD itself, with everybody, you know, kind of presenting a million projects. Um, and that was also becoming an issue in Europe, the fact that Italy had not elaborated yet, you know, its proposals for what it would do with the funds, um, which should be, you know, not just presented by April, but kind of done and dusted by April, so the money can start flowing. And I remind the viewers that Italy will be the largest re recipient of the next generation EU funding. That's one thing, but also, you know, Italy being uh, one of the founding countries of the European communities, and also a very big economy, is the, is, is the third strongest EU economy, right, after Germany and France. But in the same time, we all know that Italy has a very deep uh, financial problem because the debt is really the second in the EU. It's almost 160 percent. Um, that, you know, that's very... certainly an issue. And, you know, I mean, Italy was also the hardest hit by the pandemic because it was the first hit and really, you know, really bore the, the brunt very heavily. In terms of, you know, you're going back to your question about how Draghi's arrival is seen in Europe, as I said, very positively, sometimes perhaps for the wrong reasons, because I think I can say I was quite bothered by some of the accounts or responses, whether on the Dutch press or even, you know, the English language press or the German press saying, oh yeah, here's finally some somebody that will fix, you know, um, Italy's problems, you know, they need a Euro, you know, kind of Eurocrat, technocrat, which, you know, that's not, you know, that's not it. I mean, you know, there was a willing choice to bring in somebody who is indeed a professional. Um, but this, again, falls into these easy stereotypes of the messiness of Italian politics. And I, I think we need to steer away from that. I mean, there's other things. It, that Italian play. politics for a foreigner is quite complicated because the names change places and the parties change names. And we are really uh, caught up uh, with this. But I want to uh, ask Emilio, you describe the first Conte government as a government with two positions towards uh, the European Union. The second Conte government being pro-European. How would you describe now the government? And can you just describe to us a little bit better whom we have in the government, really? So, absolutely. Uh, the Draghi government is a pro-European government. So the very question is why the League is inside the government. So we, uh, the three main parties of the government are the Democratic Party, and as I said before, is absolutely a pro-European uh, party. We have the Five Star Movement that changed its position from a, 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 a Eurosceptic vision to a pro-European vision. The problem is related with the Liga, so the League or Liga. So mm, it, it's not easy to to give you an answer. I can explain the the move of the Five Star Movement from one position to another position. In in December uh, 2013. Uh, in the previous European uh, elections, uh, the founder of the movement, uh, his name is Beppe Grillo, uh, indicated four priorities uh, in relations with Europe. The first one was the referendum of the Euro, on the Euro. The second was the abolition of the European stability mechanism. The third was the adoption of Euro bonds and the fourth was investment outside the limits of uh, um, government deficits. So there's really a, 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 a radical change. But as I, as I said before, we can explain this change since the Five Star Movement is, an, is not a positional populist party. It's a kind of balanced populist party. They have no left or right ideological bias. They are in favor of transparency. They are in favor of democracy, uh, changing the rules in order to improve um, the, um, the growth of the country. And, uh, and scholars who studied uh, how this movement uh, behaved uh, during uh, the participation in the, the, the last parliament in, uh, in, in Europe uh, declared that the Five Star Movement statements on Europe have always tended to be somewhat generic. So they are not really against the European Union. So after the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, with the overcome the, of the European austerity and with the change in the political economy of Germany and 
and the European Commission, due to the sanitary and economic emergency, is easier for the Pfizer movement to support a pro-European government. Um, so it's not easy to understand how the League uh, changed it, its position, its Eurosceptic position. Uh, so okay, but in the same time, we have so we have a hope, and Luisa mentioned that that this government will be more stable, um, uh, led by a person who is uh, um, not only a very well-known uh, CV, but who is considered to be uh, a very rational uh, manager, let's say, an expert, not really a politician. Uh, and he's very good in finance, which is a key thing now, because you mentioned, Luisa, that we are going to uh, move on with the uh, recovery fund. Uh, Luisa, if you can just tell us what's the perception of Italy now the EU, um, concerning economy, but also this polit political instabilities that uh, Italy is facing? You know, I think... Um... I don't think, I mean, this is, you know, kind of the honest answer. I don't think, I mean, I think most Europeans and European politicians and EU politicians have other concerns right now than Italian political instability. I think there is a concern, of course, um, because if Italy becomes economically unstable and is not even able to take up the recovery fund money, I mean, that becomes an issue for the rest of Europe. So that's why, you know, I mean, certainly Draghi's arrival is seen um, in very positive terms. I mean, and here I would um, uh, call us back to last summer, to the famous European Council summit um, in July when the recovery fund was approved because, you know, it was hailed as this kind of historic Hamiltonian moment for Europe. And yet it was a very contested um, you know, uh, meeting, the, one of the longest meetings lasting five days. And the two key protagonists there were actually Giuseppe Conte and um, my, my own, I don't know if I want to really call him my own, the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, as, you know, kind of the leaders of the, the frugal four and then, you know, Conte representing the, you know, the southern states or those states that would be, you know, the main recipients of the fund. And this play of roles was really mm -hmm. quite striking. And so it's not that it has completely disappeared. I mean, the Frugals have softened some of their positions, but Ruta is going to be back in government. Um, and, you know, I mean, the other Frugals, whether it's the Austrians or the Finns, have not softened their positions and they will be watching Italy quite closely. But the fund was approved. And now the question will be, you know, how will the disbursement proceed? Um, you know, there's still the question of, you know, whether... Um, the Italian government will choose to access the ESM funds or the MES funds, as they're called in Italian. And that also became a very important um, battle um, ground for the various parties in the lead up. To of course, looking, looking at the situation from a Polish perspective, we uh, looked at Italy carefully because we also understood that in the negotiations, we are on the same side. We wanted more money to be engaged. Poland is the second after Italy recipient of the, the funds from this fund. Um, uh, Emilio, I just want to ask you, we have a question from the audience, uh, now on the other way around, how the Italian government or Italian political class uh, sees the future of the EU with this fund, with the budget which finally we accepted, we approved in, in December, so there is a new, a kind of a new opening, right, we have the budget, we had the fund, we have a fund, but the Italians are not very happy with the European Union, it seems, especially they criticize Euro, some political parties. Uh, there was even some discussion, as you rightly mentioned, the uh, Cinque Stelle movement wanted a referendum, wanted to see if uh, Euro can be, you know, somehow questioned. Lega also was mentioned that this was years ago. What is the situation now? Where are the Italians? How the Italians see the future of the EU? Uh, I think there is a very strong difference between the elite and the people. Um, the Italian elite, and uh, Mario Gradi is one of the most important um, expression of this elite, is absolutely in favor of Europe. And we have to say that the participation of Italy historically in the process of the European integration uh, was considered important in order to impose on Italy an external constraint is called in Italian vincolo esterno, a very strong external constraint, was constrained to push Italy 
towards the reforms of inside the country that were necessary for the modernization of the country and that the Italian political parties would be unable to decide and implement without, a, without this constraint alone. So the problem now is that uh, this kind of um, way to play with Europe by the elite is uh, um, um, a ride to uh, a focal point when the people uh, uh, was involved in the discussion about Europe. And but also because, you know, some decisions taken by the EU institutions were controversial in Italy. Like, for example, during migration crisis, we had this discussion in Italy around migrants and Lega was popular just because of this, because it was questioning what the EU mainstream was telling uh, us. Yeah, to immigration policy worked uh, a very, um, another very strong external constraint uh, on Italy. Um, um, Already in the 80s, Italy felt marginalized in uh, Europe, not only because of the restriction to public spending, uh, you mentioned the public debt, but also as consequence of French and German pressure on border controls. Italy was the last founder member of the European community to be allowed in the Schengen Club. It was the last one, only in the, at the end of the 90s. And because it was not able to control its border. So mm -hmm. uh, Italy decided at the end of the 90s to become an European country, really in the, at the end of the 90s, adopting the Euro currency at, at the same time, in the same years, in the same year, it was 1999 to become a, an European border. So that is the second main reason why people try start to understand what was Europe. In general, at that time, uh, the polls indicated a pro-European approach of the Italians, but it was not true. It was the Italian elite that used the, the instrument of the external constraint, the vincolo esterno, to force Italy to be a modern country. To be a but country at the same time, you know, in, in this regard, we can compare even, you know, from the Polish perspective, I can say that uh, it played a very similar role in Poland also, the European Union as a, as a, as a point of reference, as the leverage to help us to do necess necessary reforms, because without that, maybe we would have not be able to do it. But let's now look at the future, 2021 and the next decade. Luisa, if you comment, if you can comment on us, what is the expectation you are teaching European governance? How would you um, describe this moment we are in? Uh, it's not only about money and the fund, it's generally about also strategy, because we have a lot of talks about European strategic autonomy, about, you know, relations uh, where Europe should have with now with the new administration of the US, Joe Biden, about China, about Russia. Can you tell us, not maybe on one go, but let's start with the vision uh, where should be Europe in this global play and how to get there? Well, I mean, I think there's, you know, two questions where Europe should be, where the EU should be. I should, we should rephrase uh, since the EU is not Europe or all of Europe is not part of the EU. Um, and then what role can Italy play in that? I mean, as you very rightly said, I mean, there has been a push, certainly from the current commission, to work towards a more geopolitical Europe. I mean, this is the commission that defines itself as the geopolitical commission. And there has been exactly a lot of commentary over the past year, and it's slightly longer, about elaborating either what we call a strategic sovereignty, a strategic autonomy, in a variety of fields. So both in the geopolitical realm, but also importantly in the economic realm. And if you listen to what somebody like um, Josep Bore says, look, what we're saying here is that, you know, we're not looking for autarky. We're trying to not reclaim sovereignty from our partners, so from our relationship with the United States, but rather, you know, kind of take it back from other actors that are undermining our capacity, you know, to lead, to make choices and so on. 
The greatest problem in this, and I'm not the first one saying this, in elaborating a strategic sovereignty or you know, a singular kind of geopolitical agenda, are member states, whether it's Poland or Italy. And but I have to ask you at that moment, because we had a yeah. Federica Mogherini mm -hmm. at the top of the, let's say, foreign policy of the European Union. She was, of course, Italian. Mm -hmm. She had an advisor, Natalie Tocci, who is an advisor, who was one of the main authors of the European Global Strategy, Strategy a document correct. the European Union adapt, adopted in 2016. And also this term of European strategic autonomy started with this document. So if you can tell us, Luisa, uh, do you think that's uh, just a nice term to use to describe something, you know, which, or it is a real capacity Europe is able to build, the European Union is able to build? It's not yet a capacity, I would say, it's an aspiration, but an aspiration, you know, start, we have to start with an aspiration because an aspiration is also a political goal. And I mean, it's one that certainly, you know, I would share. I mean, I know uh, Natalie's work well and, the global strategy was the first explicit statement of the European Union in outlining its geopolitical goals for the future. The current commission has taken that further. And I think, you know, this notion, of course, it's a nice catchphrase, but I think it is being already operationalized. But as I but said, with, how with do we understand thoughts. it? How the how the European Union now, currently in 2021, after, you know, several years of uh, struggling with the crisis and also with the different uh, uh, external environment uh, in international relations. How would you describe this understanding of this term today? Um, well, um, you know, I, we can take various examples, whether it's, you know, and if you look at how this is being laid out by the external action service, by various European think tanks like the Euro um, European Council on Foreign Relations, they outline the fields in which this autonomy should be achieved. Um, in you know, digital telecommunications, in health. Um, and we have unfortunately seen the failures in that, certainly in the realm of health, procurement for the, you know, during the pandemic failed. I mean, clearly the EU needs more capacities and stronger coordination there. Um, in the realm of digital you know, telecommunications, going after external actors like China. Um, and mm -hmm. deciding you know, on a common ground whether we will allow control of 5G networks. But with China, and you know, to kind of to go back to even more uh, specific examples, the new investment screening mechanism that was put into place is not really a great sign because it was completely watered down. Um, you know, any attempts to take a strong stance um, in EU-China relations are always contested by some member states, including Italy. Um, mm -hmm. And so even elaborating a strong position there has not been, you know, apart from this, these words. So, I mean, I think going back to your point, maybe it's just a nice slogan. Okay, well, we have, as, as you said, a kind of an aspiration to build the European Union as an important player uh, with the world when there is definitely a rivalry between the US and China and all the other players have to somehow fit into this new game. Uh, Emilio, I would ask you at that moment, um, how would you describe um, then the position of Italy, or let's be more precise about the Italian government to these challenges, to China, first of all, and to the United States? Let's try, let's start with this game. Yeah, let me first say that the making of foreign policy in Italy uh, satisfies uh, the security need of the country, as well as in other countries, but at the same time, um, foreign policy uh, is also uh, a model, a, a way to import in Italy a model of domestic development. And that, that's the reason why Italy decides uh, the Western choice at the end of the Second World War and then decide to be part of the process of um, uh, the integration inside the European Union. So, But do you want to say that the foreign policy in Italy is somehow subordinated to the domestic, local, absolutely, national? Absolutely, yes. That's, that, that's the point. It's not only a diplomatic game in order to secure the country, to, but it's a way to import modernity and a push for reforms of the country. That is what is historically uh, the foreign policy of Italy. And this kind of foreign policy is 
um, made by the elite of the country. Uh, during the Cold War, foreign policy was not a domestic issue. It was something already decided in 1948. When Italy um, faced the end of the Cold War in uh, uh, 1992 with the Maastricht Agreement, uh, it was only a, 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 an elite who decide the external constraint for Italy. The political uh, parties were not were not able to understand <laughs> what was. But political going parties on. is the elite, is the political elite of the country, right? No, when I'm talking about the elite, I'm talking about um, a very restricted elite uh, between the, the the central bank of Italy and uh, the economic ministers of Italy. Uh, all all the the European players in Italy are related to the central bank as it is Mario Draghi. Mario Draghi was the man who was negotiating the Maastricht agreement with Guido Carli. And Guido Carli was the main um, thinker of the external constraint of the vincolo esterno. And it was Guido Carli who decided how Italy should enter in the European Union, uh, in the European Monetary Union. And and he made this choice uh, without the support of the political parties. Okay, and so if this is the truth for Italy, what will happen now with China and the US? What is this secret elite saying? And what will be the, the political debate who maybe, you know, which maybe not, it's not the crucial to take decisions for this country? I mean, uh, Draghi was very clear. One of the first statements of uh, is, um, uh, address to the, to the parliament was, we need a Western and European anchorage. It was very clear to this point. So the discussion of this morning uh, at, in Brussels at the NATO summit, that the, the NATO has to, be, to come back to be a strong alliance against Russia and China, and that was the Trump administration doctrine. And it's the same doctrine with Biden. And since Biden and Trump has the same foreign policy in terms of geopolitics, is very, very, very well accepted by Draghi. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why Draghi is the prime minister in this period in Italy, and why of the reason why Mattarella chose uh, decide to uh, appoint uh, him. Uh, but uh, there is an old saying in Italy: "We have made Italy. Now we must make." Italians. Um, so what, but this is a say from 19th century. I hope you progress a little but, bit. Yeah, but now maybe <laughs> we have made Draghi government now must make Europeans. That's the point that an uh, uh, important political scientist uh, Gianfranco Pasquino said <laughs> In a in a paper in a paper. In a, in a, okay, that's a very interesting point because we have this discussion all over Europe that we have European Union, we have the constructions of European institutions, we have finances, we have many things, we have law, but we don't have really Europeans as far as you know how the people maybe feel themselves. They feel more Italians, French, Poles, etc. Emilia, um, Luisa, I would like to ask you about the current. Um, the current discussion concerning this US-China rivalry, because Europe has to define itself. Of course, European uh, uh, autonomy is one of the concepts, but in the same time, people also have a lot of doubts concerning the US. Europeans, many Europeans, especially in, uh, in France, also in Italy, in Spain, are not necessarily uh, very enthusiastic to the US anymore. Poland seems to be one of the very few countries who is traditionally very pro-American. Uh, while in the same time, Italy would be a very good example of a country where the, um, the perception of China is better and better. Um, and for example, Xi Jinping was much more respected last year than Donald Trump. Of course, maybe with Biden, it would be a shift. But uh, uh, how can we, you know, how Europeans can um, resolve this dilemma? 
Well, um, I think two things. First, I do want to kind of, I guess, contest your first sentence that there are no Europe, that we still must make Europeans. There are plenty of Europeans who feel themselves very strongly European. And I was really encouraged to see in the last Dutch elections, a party, a tr the first transnational European party like Volt, created by the way, by an Italian, <laughs> um, you know, actually gaining seats in parliament. So I think that's changing. I mean, it may be also a generational change, but I think that's changing. And the question there is what kind of Europe, you know, these people are imagining and they want. But to come back to the question of China, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, all the surveys that I've seen from the ECFR or others, I mean, indicate this shift also in, ge you know, kind of popular geopolitical orientations. So what citizens, not just state leaders, not just European elites, feel Europe's natural partners are, who do they trust, who do they trust less? And it was, in fact, striking the, you know, kind of the complete lack of trust in the United States um, with Donald Trump. But the questions that these surveys ask is, will this change after the Trump presidency? And the answer was no, we will continue not to trust the United States and feel they are a reliable coalition partner for economic, you know, coalitions, geopolitical coalitions, etc. And in this sense, you're absolutely right. Poland was very much an outlier. Coming back to China, I think the issue there is, um, you know, uh, and there we have to also be kind of careful because I think we, we tend to present the Chinese kind of incursions into Europe. So takeover of key infrastructure nodes like ports, I mean, you know, buying out the port of Piraeus in Greece. In Italy, you know, large investments in the port of Trieste, um, but not only, um, you know, as part of building of the Belt and Road Initiative. The narrative is that it's the kind of weaker countries in Europe's south, so whether Greece and Italy, and Italy because if you, you know, you will be aware of this, you know, kind of um, 16 plus one, now 17 plus one Visegrad initiative that has been elaborating, you know, independently of the EU relations, economic and otherwise with China. So it's very hard to have a consistent, coherent EU policy and EU autonomy if you know there is this divide but the europeans give uh, both sides you know not uh, it's not uh, clear to understand what is the position because from one side we signed the agreement investment agreement in december uh, pushed by the german presidency which means that it opens up a little bit more the chinese market for the european investments by the way the agreement which is not yet ratified and heavily criticized also within the uh, european political circles especially by the left now it's a hot debate in france about it if macron did a very good thing to sign it to support signing it but in the same time the eu just recently two days ago implemented sanctions against china because of the uh, because of the restrictions for human rights uh, especially in xinjiang but also hong kong and all together so it's 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 not coherent could you explain to us you know, it's not coherent as most, unfortunately, things in European foreign policy are not coherent. I think, you know, the sanctions had to be implemented. I mean, there was already pressure from the European Parliament and individual EU states for a long time. But, you know, sanctions are one thing, but as long as you keep doing business and, you know, big business with China, I mean, those sanctions will mean very, very little. I mean, you know, I, you can you can hear from what I'm saying that I would be much more in favor in taking a tougher stance with China, um, especially protecting key sectors of the European um, market, whether it's, you know, telecommunications or otherwise, um, or, you know, critical infrastructure. I mean, you know, as I, you know, I was talking about the port of Piraeus, I'm sure, you know, most people don't know that in the port of Rotterdam, the two main container shipping um, terminals are now owned by Chinese companies as well. Mm. And you know, this is the Europe's largest seaport. So it's definitely something we will discuss uh, uh, further in, in the EU itself. And of course, it will be a debate between Europeans and Americans. Um, but I, I want a media to ask, I have to ask you about Russia. Because um, of course, for Poland, Russia is the the country we look at all the time it's our neighbor we regret we don't have good relations with russia and uh, it's the question mark what to do with that but italians are considered to be traditionally russophile traditionally not pro-russian maybe but a little bit more open for russian point of view what is the perception of russia in the italian political elites particularly by this government what could be the position towards russia and also for example, in case of sanctions, we constantly have against Russian government since 2014. 
uh, I agree with with Luisa. The problem is business. Uh, Italy is a trading state in foreign policy, and Italy needs to find new markets. And Russia is a, a very important market for Italy. So, um, uh, with the, the Prodi government, with the center left government, we were able to improve our relations with uh, with the Russia. And then with the Berlusconi government, there was a special feeling between Berlusconi and Putin. But beyond this feeling, this is personal feeling, there are economic interests. Anyway, uh, there is uh, a, a, a news. Uh, we have now a big problem with Russia. A Russian, uh, Russian influence in Libya um, is, a very, is really a problem for Italy. Uh, Russia is against the Berlin process hmm? um, in order to find a kind of stability, not democracy, but uh, uh, a, state, a new state building in, uh, in Libya. And um, the security of Libya also for migrations is very, very important for Italy. So, so now we need, we need uh, NATO, we need Biden, we need the European Union, and we need Germany inside the Mediterranean in order to stop the Russian influence in Libya. So international politics is a strange game. In terms of security, Italy is absolutely anchored to the Western world and to Europe, with no doubts. Uh, we are a NATO country and we're going to remain a very convinced NATO country, but when it is possible <laughs> to enlarge our interest in terms of trade, uh, we need good relations with Russia, we need good relations with China. Uh, uh, peace is very important for Italy, but not because we are for pacifism, we are against the military confrontation. No, peace is important because Italy is a mid-sized power that, need, uh, that needs uh, a, a peaceful environment in order to, to, to improve its, its capacity to be an exported lead uh, economy. Well, you said uh, it's a lot to do with the economy, and it's true. It's not only seen in Italy. We have a problem um, about Nord Stream 2, which Germans promote as an economic project. Um, of course, the countries of Central Eastern Europe uh, describe it as political initiative, the US push. Um, for um, changing the approach to this project, but the U.S. Um, uh, under Biden wants to ha want to have also good relations with Germany. So it's very complicated. Most likely, this project continues. And um, Luisa, to you, the question: What would you expect now in the next two three years uh, to happen in the EU? Because you are t teaching geopolitics, also you are teaching European governance as well. So uh, taking into consideration all these dilemmas that Europe, European Union is not a country, European Union is, is, is a 27 member state club where nothing is easy, easy especially foreign policy. Um, what are really the key elements for the EU to go on with this project? I think, first of all, to get out of crisis mode, and that will take a while because until the main preoccupation is managing the pandemic, um, it will be very difficult to elaborate a coherent foreign policy. Although, you know, the management of the pandemic has already been bound up with foreign policy choices, whether it's, you know, choosing to buy certain vaccines, whether the Russian one or the Chinese one, and, you know, already dividing lines are being drawn across Europe. Um, to, you know, trade policy. I mean, when Mario Draghi, you know, was the first one to exercise, you know, the possibility of blocking exports of AstraZeneca, you know, a lot was made out of that saying, oh, you know, vaccine nationalism and so on, rather than actually, you know, this was, you know, keeping them to their contractual obligations. So I think first we need to emerge out of this crisis moment. And I really hope that um, this moment will allow us to build a different Europe. I mean, I sound like I'm speaking for the Commission, but I really believe in that. I mean, I, you know, I really hope that we can come out with something positive out of this, you know, really terrible year now going on two years. Um, and I wonder if, you know, the, this next generation EU fund, even though it's an internal fund, can help in that, um, can, you know, kind of help 
also erase some of these divides. Um, but I think the biggest challenges will be elaborating a common position, both vis-a-vis -vis China as well as vis-a-vis -vis Russia, and figuring out to what degree we want to be coupled in the transatlantic partnership. On what issues? Mm -hmm. Last question will go to Emilio. Uh, similar question, uh, but position different uh, perspective. For the Italians, when I look at the opinion polls, I see that the Italians as a society uh, address healthcare as a number one issue today. Uh, of course, pandemic is, is the reason for that. But what would be the other point on this list? What is the key thing for the Italian in the nearest months and years uh, the list to uh, be able to feel that the situation goes in a better direction? I just mentioned that in Italy, unemployment seems to be now uh, better. I mean, the, the, the rate is lower. Migration, uh, uh, the crisis seems to be handled now better than it used to be in 2015, 16, 17. So what are really the issues now for Italians? Yeah, but maybe the health system, uh, the, we, uh, we are going towards an European policy, an European health policy, according to the next generation EU. And I think that it will be a very important chance in order to uh, to change the Italian uh, hostility and critical stance against uh, the European Union. And, and I think it's also related to, to the economy recovery. But I'm not so optimistic in terms of migrations. It is true that with the pandemic, uh, the flow of immigrants um, uh, diminished uh, really, but uh, I don't know what will happen in the next uh, year. Uh, with, in September, the European Union, as you know, decided the new pact for migrations no? uh, on the flow of the optimistic uh, atmosphere after the, uh, the negotiation about, uh, on the, uh, about the recovery in, uh, in, in July. And this pact it is not really good for Italy. Um, as the, the, the first point is related to the, the, the border. So Italy now is an European border. <laughs> this is the kind of agreement. So how can we control this border? During the pandemic, it's, it's really easy. Uh, so we can stop migrants in the boats uh, <laughs> uh, the, for the quarantine. But after the pandemic, what is going to happen? Uh, so I think the migration issue uh, will be a very uh, cold issue in, uh, in the future, also in the relation uh, between Italy and Italian people with the European institutions. Let, yes, let's just recall the fact that uh, uh, Italy was on the first front of um, this uh, migration crisis and is still there. Pandemic, of course, stopped the movement, but what will happen in summer, let's see. Uh, and we have Lega in the government yeah. back. So that would mean that maybe uh, all, these, all this rhetoric, which was so uh, much popular in Italy, but so much criticized in the European Union, anti-emigration uh, rhetoric will be back. But in the same time, we have Mario Draghi, who is pro-European and whose approach is different. So it will be very interesting to watch, as always, Italian politics. Uh, let me stop here because our time is over. Just to remind our viewers, Italy has a new government since 13 of February without elections. It was a change because of the shift in the political between political parties. We have three parties in the government, uh, Lega, which is uh, right, conservative, uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle, for the five star movement, which is uh, difficult to describe, center left maybe, and PD again uh, left uh, government and Mario Draghi as a prime minister. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, I hope for the best for Italy, for your country. And uh, let us uh, invite our viewer for our next talk next Tuesday, as always, five o'clock. Thank you. Goodbye. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye.